Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everybody. Hope everyone's doing well, inshallah. Already. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Sorry guys, just getting my notes set up. Okay. Um, welcome back to our Sunday night uh, reading of Ibn Atta'illah's book, Taj al-Arus, which is a um, kind of a curriculum of spirituality and development for each individual. Um, mashallah, it's, it's a really profound uh, text in which he summarizes a lot of really amazing reflections that people should have about their own spiritual development. And um, being an Egyptian, he does it in a way that's very, uh, you know, has a lot of metaphors, a lot of examples, a lot of deep thoughts. And he takes a lot of uh, what we would consider to be, you know, a large survey of Islamic concepts and uh, verses and uh, a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He's able to con contain them in a, in a small uh, reminder. Um, and so this week, this week, um, his reminder is something that is really awesome. And um, it seems like every week that I read uh, from this book with everybody here on Sunday, um, it speaks to me more than it speaks to anybody else. So what does he talk about this week? Ibn Atta'Allah this week is talking about uh, something that we all experience and something that uh, probably on a daily occurrence basis, we all have uh, concerns about the dunya, about this world. And uh, at times, our concerns about the dunya can outweigh our concerns about the akhirah. Uh, the dunya being this material life and the akhirah being the next life, the eternal life. And so he addresses the reality and he actually really frames it in a beautiful way that makes people realize, it makes us realize like how foolish it is for a person to be so bogged down by their concerns of the dunya that in their uh, capacity of being able to only hold on to so much, right? Because everybody is finite, everybody is limited. You can only hold on to so much. And so whoever gives up, whatever space you're giving up in your heart for concern of something is something, is a space and is a resource that you will not be able to lend to anything else, okay? So if I'm really worried about something, then it's going to occupy a large portion of my consciousness and my heart, and I won't be able to simultaneously have that same resource of my heart be concerned about anything else, okay? So he, Ibn Atta'Allah, he places things in those variables and he makes us feel how, how foolish it is. So he says, uh, that the one who is weighed down by concerns of this world, that they are totally and completely occupied by the concerns of this world, that they're so dependent upon it, that it's the only thing that concerns them. And by the way, the, the verb he used, ala, um, it comes from the root ayn yalam, ayala, which means to be, uh, which means to be tied to something or dependent on something. And so part of why we are so concerned and have so much anxiety over the material dunya is because we're so dependent upon it, right? The more dependent you are on something, the more anxiety that thing brings you. The more liabilities you have in your life, the more debt you take onto your life, the more liability you take into your life, the more anxiety you're going to have about these things, right? And that's why, you know, as Sheikh Biggie, uh, you know, said, more money, more problems. Like the reality is that when you have more, you start to have more concerns. And so, uh, and, and even right now, I was looking at some, some uh, tweets of, some you know mutual people that I know on, on Twitter, and they were saying about how they wish that they hadn't signed a lease for a certain car or a certain place to, to, to live, an apartment in a high upscale area, or this, this, this. And again, who could have anticipated uh, such a situation? But 
nevertheless, they said, I wish I never did that because, you know, now that I'm living back with my parents or now that I've moved away or I'm working from home, I don't need this car anymore. And I got this car and it was like super expensive, very fancy, very nice brand. And they said that, you know, I didn't have to do that. I could have gotten something a little bit more, you know, moderate, a little bit more modest. And I wouldn't have had this situation now where I'm paying, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars a month for a car that I'm not even driving anymore. Right. Um, like I gave it to myself. Uh, I, I told myself that I'd be I needed this car, this luxurious ride because I was driving so much. I was commuting to work. And in reality, I knew I was just kind of fulfilling my desires, my nuts. And uh, and now I'm realizing that I really made a, a horrible decision. So the, the the word here that Ibn Atala uses when he says, like, whoever is tied down by their concerns of this world, the reality is the more you allow yourself to be tied down, the more you tie yourself down by things that give you liabilities, by things that tie you down, naturally, the more anxiety you're going to feel, okay? Um, and so he says, He says, He says, the one who is overwhelmed or tied down by their, by their concerns of this world, and in the process of it, because like we said, every human heart is a finite space, it's a finite property. In the process of that concern, they find themselves no longer being concerned about the akhirah. So I'm really concerned about the dunya. I'm really concerned about the things that I wear, the things that I drive, where I live, the house that I want to buy. I have these aspirations. And I find myself not really concerned with the akhirah. So at the same time that I'm thinking a lot about the home that I'm going to live in or the job that I want to have or this, I don't find myself planning for hajj, right? Or at the same time that I think to myself about the investments I want to make, and the different things I want to spend my money on, I don't find myself so much thinking about where I want to give my charity, right? Actually, one of the most amazing, one of the most amazing stories I'd ever heard was one of my dear friends, mashallah, who his father, okay, his father told him, um, so my, a friend of mine said that his father told him, when you graduate, when you finish, he was training to be a doctor, he said, when you finish being a doctor, when you're, when you're done, he said, the first thing you want to do, the first thing you want to do with that first paycheck or that signing bonus or whatever you get, the first larger amount of money, now that you have your degree, now that you have this, he said, the first thing you want to do is you want to decide which charities you're going to support. You want to, you want to sign up for that right now. You don't want to wait, right? And he said, the reason why is you want your first thing that you do with your money to be something that is illustrating and demonstrating your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after you're done doing that, then only after you're done doing that, then you can decide what you want to spend your money on for, for yourself. And I thought this was a beautiful concept. Like think about it. Every paycheck you get, if you get a paycheck every week or every two weeks before you decide that you're going to go ahead and spend a little bit on yourself, you know, that your bank account's been replenished and you got some more money before you go over to Amazon or you go to the, you know, the, the, you can't really go to the mall anymore. At least you shouldn't be going to the mall anymore, at least without a mask. Um, before you go online and start online shopping and you start to reassure yourself that I have enough money to do this because I just got paid. Maybe the, 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 the best step forward would be, don't give yourself more concerns of the dunya, rather give yourself, fulfill some, some concerns of the akhirah. That Allah Ta'ala has given me this money, I have to make sure that I do right by it. I have to make sure that I take my sadaqah first, right? And, uh, uh, you know, everyone gives uncles and aunties a lot of friction. <laughs> everyone gives uncles and aunties a lot of friction. And there are a lot of things that maybe uncles and aunties, uh, you know, in their expectations and cultural practices and things like that. It's interesting, right? Could be problematic and whatnot. Um, or it, at the very least, it could be a little bit annoying. But I will say one thing, that uh, when you look at, I was speaking one time to a, an elder and I asked him, I said, you know, you guys came for education and you got your degrees and then you got your jobs and you were in a new country. How did you guys build these institutions, these masajid? How did you... Like, how did you navigate the system? How were you able to, to build these institutions, these masjids? 
And the uncle told me something I'll never forget. He said, you know, the difference between my generation and your generation, because he has kids, he said, is that in my generation, we would get our paychecks and we would set aside our charity, just like the story I told you about my friend. We would set aside our donation to the masjid first. And then only after we had set that aside, we would then spend from whatever we had left. <clears throat> we would spend from whatever we had left. He said, but with your generation, he was saying with you, right? And I'm in my 30s. So he has, he has children that are my age. He said that I noticed that with my son and my daughters, etc. He said that they will, when they get paid, when they look at their, their wealth, they spend on themselves first. And then whatever they have left over, that becomes their charity budget. That becomes the budget for sadaqah. That after I purchase things for myself, my family, after I went and bought all my nice fancy groceries, right? Majority of which maybe I didn't need, right? The ribeye steaks and the this, this, all that, right? Which we're all, we all have our own indulgences. The fancy coffee machines, right? I'll put myself in there. Uh, then after we spent on ourselves, then we say, okay, now I have this much left for sadaqah, okay? So he said the difference is, like he said, his example was, I bought myself a Toyota Camry in order to make sure that I could give this much to my masjid. That was his mindset. He goes, my son got a BMW M5. And, you know, the amount that he was paying for his car payment was the amount that I was giving to the masjid. And the amount that I was paying for my car payment was the amount he gives to the masjid. Right? The Camry's 200 bucks a month. The M5, you know, 800, 900 bucks a month maybe. Right? Maybe more than that. $1,000 a month. Okay? And he says that, look at the ratio, look at the difference, okay? So this is kind of what Ibn Atala is sort of alluding to. He's saying, if you look at your actions and you find that all of your concern, all of your strategy, all of the things that you find yourself daydreaming about and thinking about are things that are naturally just concerns of this dunya, and you don't find yourself really thinking and reflecting about concerns of the akhirah, he says, then you are like this person. He says, he says that, Okay. Uh, he says that you're like a, a you're like a person who a lion has come to them, chasing them to eat them, basically. Okay, that a person that the lion is coming to devour you. That a flea bit you. That a flea bit you. Okay, and you became more concerned, you started to become occupied and distracted by that bite than you were on al asad over the lion. Like, how absurd would that situation be if you find someone who's running away from a lion that's chasing it, trying to devour it, and then a little mosquito or a little flea comes and bites a person, and when they bite them, they're like, oh, and they stop running and say, oh. That hurt, right? That's really annoying. Why would this flea bite me? Why did the mosquito bite? Oh no, the mosquito bit me. I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a bump here now. Does anyone have any uh some lotion or some calamine or some hydrocortisone? You know, like could you imagine that person stopping? They're putting themselves. So what's the example he's saying? Is that he's saying, like, you know, you have this really serious critical need. It's a critical need. It's not like a you know, being chased by a lion that's gonna devour you is a critical need. Okay. If you stop, the lion will get you. In fact, even if you keep, if you're in my shape and you keep running, the lion's going to get you. Okay, and that person, in the middle of their critical need, critical life or death, they have a small inconvenience that distracts them, and it completely takes their focus away from what's critical. Okay, the akhirah for us is critical. The afterlife is critical. The, the next life is critical. And you see Allah Ta'ala has these conversations with people in the Qur'an. He gives us the preview. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala gives us the preview in the Qur'an of like what that conversation is going to be like. Where the people are begging. May Allah Ta'ala protect us from being amongst this group. These people are begging for a return. Oh Allah, give us one hour. Give us one day. Give us one more chance. Back in the dunya, we promise. We'll do things right. We won't be distracted. We'll do things better. And Allah Ta'ala will tell them that, no, you had your chance. And in other places, he'll tell them that even if I were to give you, you would go back and do the same thing. Right? You would go back and do the same thing because naturally you're distracted. So he says that 
the person is absolutely distracted, okay, by that asad, by or uh, by that by that bug over the line on al asad. He says, "Fa'inna man ghafala an Allahi or an Allah ishtaghala bil haqir." He says that anyone who has been distracted away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay, whoever finds themselves distracted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter what you compare the thing that's distracting you to, it is haqir. Haqir means insignificant, nothing. Like the wrapper of a candy bar, insignificant, right? Absolutely, it's, it's, even, it's even less significant than insignificant. The things that we don't even think about. You know, today I had a, today I, I, I opened up um, a frame. We bought this picture frame. And there's so much like wrapping and plastic and all this stuff. There's so many pieces that are just totally, I understand they have to wrap it, but it's so insignificant, right? You can't even reuse it. Like the wrapping and all that, it's like, whatever. You can't even do anything with it. You know, you can reuse a lot of things, by the way. Card, when you have kids, you can reuse a lot of things. Every cardboard box is an art project. Every cardboard box is a pillow fort. You can reuse a lot of stuff. But this stuff is completely and totally wasted. It's even, I don't even remember throwing it away. It was so insignificant, right? So that's the definition of haqir. He says, فَإِنَّ مَنْ غُفِلَ عَنَ اللَّهِ اشْتَغَلَ بِالْحَقِيرِ That that person has been totally distracted by something that's completely insignificant, okay? وَمَنْ لَمْ يَغْفُلْ That the person لَمْ يَشْتَغِلْ Illa bihi, and the person who is not distru- who is not um, the person who does not neglect Allah, the person who doesn't neglect Allah will always be occupied by Allah. So it really comes down to one question, which is, does a person do ghafla of Allah or not? If a person does ghafla of Allah, then whatever they're being distracted by is insignificant. If a person does not find themselves distracted by anything else and they're focusing on Allah, then that means that they will have the capacity, okay? That they will be remembering Allah Ta'ala. They'll be occupied by Allah. So if a person wants to become somebody who is able to pray more, is able to do more dhikr, is able to remember Allah more, you know, you look at somebody and you you admire them because of their piety, their, 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 their taqwa, their spirituality. You say, I wish I could be like that person, man. I wish I could be like that brother, that sister, man. They always remember Allah. Like they're always, you know, there's just they have this 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 light that emanates from them. Maybe it's because we are thinking too much about other things. Maybe we haven't given our heart and minds the ability to to focus on other things. Okay, so he says that if a person finds themselves not not neglectful of Allah, then they will be able to focus on Him. Okay, then he says. The best state, فَأَحْسَنُ أَحْوَالَكَ Okay? That the best state that you can do is that you can be the one, the best situation you can find yourself in is when you what? تَوَفَّتَكَ الدُّنْيَا لِتَحْسِيلُ الْآخِرَةِ That you will, you will forfeit and you will willingly concede Right, you will willingly concede. You will let expire to a fataka. Right, that it's almost like to let something die. Really, that you will let something expire from the dunya so that you can get the akhirah. And he says this is the best state that a person can find themselves in. That you will let something expire, man. Subhanallah, that's difficult. That's difficult. You know why? Because most of the compromising that we make when it comes to dunya and akhirah. It's not about letting something go. It's about letting something wait. It's about letting something wait. And especially in this era where there's things like DVR and there's things like pausing live television. I remember, man, when I was, when I was, when I was younger uh, and we used to watch like, um, you know, sports and stuff on TV and it was time to pray. We used to try to pray when. When, when does everyone try to perform their prayers? When there's a sport, when there's like a football game or a basketball game on, when do when do people try to get their salah in? They try to get it in during halftime or commercials, right? May Allah Taala forgive all of us when we were younger and some of us even now. 
halftime or commercials, right? And it's and the reason why was because we wanted to make sure that we prayed, but we didn't. We also did not want to sacrifice what our nefs wanted. So this was like best of both worlds, right? We're able to pray, and we're able to uh, you know get our prayer in, but at the same time, we're able to not miss what we want. And he's saying, no, that's not that's not it. He said, that's okay, but it's not true love. It's not true love, man. True love is when you give something up for what you love. Truly loving Allah is when you let something go. It's not about letting it wait. You know what? Let me put let me put this on hold. I'm gonna go do do this thing for Allah, and then I'll be back and it'll be waiting for me. That's that's okay, but it's not true love. True love is, you know what? I want this. I want this, but I know that Allah wants this from me. And even if I can't have what I want in my heart, I really, really want more to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what I want. That's why money and sadaqah, that's why the Prophet said, sadaqah to burhan, that sadaqah is the proof. That's why money and giving charity is like one of the strongest proofs that a person really loves Allah because you can't give money away and get it back. You can't give charity and get it back, right? Even the person who gives charity, you know, even like the small tax benefit, it's still not getting that money back. You've truly, you've shown, you've proven to yourself and to Allah, you know what Allah, you said about the human being, you love money, but oh Allah, I love you more than I love money. That's why I'm giving it away, okay? So he says, فَأَحْسَنُ أَحْوَلَكَ and to wafataka ad dunya li tahsilul akhira that the best state that you can find yourself in is when you let the dunya go and you let it expire, not pause, expire, so that you could obtain the akhira for the sake of the akhira, okay? In order to attain the afterlife. Okay. Um, and then he says, he says, but how often the afterlife will escape a person. Okay, dunya. How often a, a a the person who is seeking the dunya, how often will the akhira escape that person because they're seeking the dunya? That the person is seeking whether it's like work and they miss prayers, or whether it's social life and they miss, you know, they make mistakes in their in their in their actions. How often do we let the dunya take the place of the akhira in our in our life, okay, and then he gives like a, a statement where he he takes um, he takes uh, opposites. Basically, he takes something that cannot be present in somebody, and he says, "What if you found this characteristic in this person? Something that cannot be present in somebody. So you found somebody who's supposed to be generous, and they're cheap, right?" He says, you wouldn't, it's not okay. That's not okay. It's not okay for somebody who says they're generous to be cheap, right? So he says, He says, and how disgraceful is it for a person who is a soldier, who's a soldier to be a coward, right? He said, how disgraceful would it be? to find someone who is a soldier to have cowardice inside of them. Uh, and he says, uh, This is like talking about me. He says, and how, how disgraceful would it be for a person who is a specialist in, in, uh, in like grammar and language to be somebody who is bad with their language, right? Like when somebody is a, pro a professor of, of grammar, you don't expect them to make mistakes. If somebody is intelligent in their writing, you don't expect them to have mistakes in their grammar and typo. He said, how disgraceful would it be for somebody to be like the premier writer and they make mistakes in their writing? And then he says, وَمَا أَقْبَحَ طَلَبَ الدُّنْيَا لِمَنْ يُظْهِرَ الزُّهْدَ فِيهَا He said, and how ugly and disgraceful would it be for a person who... Yudhira as Zuhda fiha, that the person who gives their the impression, the person who gives the impression that they're pious 
and that they only want Allah, he said, how, how, how disgusting would it be that that person who says, I love Allah, that they love the world, the dunya more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they seek the dunya more than they seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, like, really, when you look at yourself as a person and you ask yourself the question of, like, you know, do I love Allah? Do I really want to be close to Allah? Do I really want to get close to my faith? And the answer to those questions, sorry, I got my event app. And the answer to those questions is, yes, I want to be close to Allah. He says, وَمَا أَقْبَحَ طَلَبَ الدُّنْيَا لِمَنْ يُظْهِرُ الزُّهْدَ فِيهَا That the person who seeks uh, the dunya, that they give off the impression that they're pious. Right? May Allah Ta'ala protect us, man. This is very, very scary stuff. So here he's, he's talking about, again, being able to be a person who prioritizes and makes sure. And this is something that, although he's speaking in very abstract concepts here, it's something that's very easy to do on a regular basis, which is you just have to get used to thinking about your actions as you do them throughout the day. You have to do some sort of evaluation and assessment of yourself throughout the day, muraqaba and muhasaba throughout the day. The things that you're doing, why are you doing them? Okay? And it's, it's easy, honestly, as shifting your intention. It's as easy as thinking about Allah when you're doing something. I'm making breakfast for my kids, okay? This is an action that I have to do regardless. The intelligent person, the one who loves Allah, would make even that action about Allah. I'm, 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 you know, I'm taking care of my children. It's a responsibility that Allah Ta'ala has put upon me, and I'm fulfilling this responsibility. That action is something I have to do anyways. You know, you're a father or you're a mother taking care of your kids. You're a son or your daughter. You're a son or you're, you are a daughter. And you're, tr and you're being good to your parents, right? You're checking on your parents. This is something Allah Ta'ala has already asked you to do. Okay, and be good to your parents. So while you're doing this, if a person truly is prioritizing their akhirah, they're not thinking about the dunya. You know, some of us call our parents for the dunya reason of guilt, and we don't want our parents to make us feel bad. And we, but some of us call our parents for the akhirah reason of this is why this is what Allah Ta'ala wants of me, and I have to do it. Right? So thinking about what Allah Ta'ala wants of me as I'm doing something, it easily shifts the intention. It's it's really a remarkable, uh, it's a remarkable thing to do. So that's number one. Okay. Um he, the commentator of this book will go for about eight more minutes. He says that the dunya is the cause of so much distraction, and the dunya can be the cause of uh, uh, so much, uh, you know, munsiyat, like so many forgetful moments. It's one of the reasons the dunya can be the reason why somebody is so distracted and so forgetful uh, in their life. Okay, in their life, and it's. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he describes this to us in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran when Allah Ta'ala says that Zuyina lil nasi hubbu shahwati min al nisa'i that the, the, the enjoyment Allah Ta'ala has beautified these worldly desires for everybody, whether it's you know women for men or men for women, uh wal banin, children, wal qanatir, uh uh you know, these treasures of gold, okay, مُنْقَنْتَرَةِ uh, or silver, مِنَ الذَّهْبِ وَالْفِدَّةِ these treasures of gold and silver, okay, وَالْخَيْلِ الْمُصَوَّمَةِ and these horses that Allah Ta'ala has given, وَالْأَنْعَامِ and cattle, وَالْحَرْفِ and other uh, fertile places of land. He said, ذَلِكَ مَتَاعٌ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا that all of these things that people find their enjoyment in, they are activities of pleasure for this life. Right, there are activities of pleasure for this life, and some of these things, you know, we are uh, in the 21st century. We may not find enjoyment in like horses and cattle, but we find enjoyment in different things. Okay, we find enjoyment in cars and technology and food, and you know, th there are entire social media accounts dedicated towards fashion and food and coffee and travel. These are things that we enjoy, right? We enjoy these things. And Allah Ta'ala says, ذَلِكَ مَتَعُونَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا These are things that you will enjoy in this life. That Allah Ta'ala has created for people to enjoy. وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حُسْنُ الْمَآبِ And Allah Ta'ala says, but all of these things, they have their ending. And with Allah is the best destination. With Allah is the best destination. That 
everything that Allah Ta'ala has listed from this list of desires, you know, spouse, spousal intimacy, having kids, uh, treasures of gold and silver, fine horses, right? And for us, we can translate that to like cars and different things. Uh, cattle, right? Food. People love burgers and steaks and kebabs and all kinds of stuff. Okay, fertile land. People love owning property. They love traveling to beautiful places. Uh, they love fashion. All of these things. He says that what you know, this is something that he created for us to enjoy. But if we really were smart, we would understand that with Allah is the greatest level of enjoyment. That's why the descriptions of Jannah. In the hadith, they say that people will like be eating fruit and they'll be eating a fruit and they'll say that this reminds me of a fruit from the dunya, but this is way better. Like it reminds me of something, but this is way better. This is way better, but it reminds me of something back in the dunya. Because Allah Ta'ala, he told us here that no matter what you have here, the akhirah is better, right? Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran that the afterlife is two things. It's better than what you have. And it's longer lasting. It's everlasting. So no matter what we have here, even if it's really super enjoyable, it's still going to go away. It's still going to end, right? So Allah Ta'ala is telling us that the akhirah is way better because number one, it's actually better in experience. But number two, you never have to worry about an end date. You never have to worry about something ending, right? This life is like a, is like a vacation. When you go on vacation, even if you're going on vacation for two weeks, long vacation, right? One week, two weeks. The first day you get there, even though it's the first day you're there, you're excited. Mentally, you still know in the end of your mind. Or in the back of your mind, you still have two weeks. You're like, I got to go back home. Right? In Jannah, there will be nothing like that. So Allah Ta'ala quotes that verse to show us that. Okay? Um, but it's interesting, subhanAllah, because one of the extremes that a person can take from this is that because this whole chapter is about making sure you prioritize the akhirah over the dunya. One of the extremes that a person can take from this uh, idea, and this is important, you know, and, and the commentator here, he writes this very beautifully. Uh, he quotes some other scholars too. He says that, you know, everything that Allah Ta'ala gives you in terms of wealth, he says, insan, that this is a test for human beings. This is a way in which Allah Ta'ala has decided to test us, okay? So just, you know, wealth in and of itself, wealth in and of itself is not evil, right? Having wealth, having food, having these things is not evil. Rather, it's a test for us to see what we would do with it. You know, wealth is like a magnifying glass of the soul. That when a person has wealth, all it does is magnify what is already in their soul. I have a friend that recently got a very nice new car and he uh, or he got a nice car brand and they have a very nice premium model and he got the model underneath it. He got like a, a mid tier model, let's say, right? It was a very nice premium model. He could have gotten it. He could have afforded it, but he got the lower mid tier model. And when he was telling me, you know, he's like, yeah, I could have gotten the really, really nice one actually. He said, but I didn't want to get that one and then put my ability to give sadaqah at risk. You know, he's like, I'm very comfortable being able to give charity to certain organizations or certain efforts. And he said, if I were to put myself in a, if I were to tie myself down to that premium model car, I don't know if I would have had the same ease in trying to give charity that I do now. I don't want to take that away from myself, right? So, He's the, the the author here is saying that yes, wealth can be bad, but really he says hada, right? He said hada mal imtihanu lil insan. He says it's it's a test for people, and he says it can be something that raises somebody, it can be something that elevates you, it elevates you or it conquers you. Wealth can elevate or conquer somebody, okay? And it can either be somebody that gives somebody goodness, or it's a plague that can consume this person in totality, he says, okay? Uh, and he gives the example, and there's a beautiful example, actually, that he quotes from a hadith uh, where Amr bin As, the Prophet commanded him um, to get 
to get ready for a, a battle, to get ready for to put his armor on. And so Amr ibn As, he he um he he got ready and he came out and he said that the Prophet Sallallahu he said he looked at me uh and he said to me that oh oh Amr, he said that I am going to um I'm going to put you in charge, right, of a battle, of a, of, a, of an army, okay? And then he says, فَيُغْنِمُكَ فَيُغْنِمُكَ Allah That Allah Ta'ala will give you what? Allah Ta'ala will give you spoils of war. The Prophet ﷺ was just telling Amr. He wasn't trying to, like, this wasn't a bribe, of course, no. He was just telling him. He says, oh, Amr, I'm going to put you, right? He said, inni uridu. And أَبْعَثَكَ عَلَى جَيْشِئٍ That I'm going to put you in charge of. I'm going to raise an army through you, basically. I'm going to put you in charge of an army. فَيُغْنِمُكَ Allah, And Allah Ta'ala is going to uh, give you spoils of war. Okay? And he says that we will, you know, he says, وَأَرْغَبُ لَكَ رَغْبَةً مِنَ الْمَالِ That we will give you the right measure of mal, al mal salihatan. We'll give you the right measure of mal, of money. So Amr, he said back to the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, he says, Inni lam uslimu, I never accepted Islam, raghbatan fil mal, out of desire for uh, for property. I never wanted, I never desired money out of this, right? That wasn't my desire. He says, Innama aslamtu raghbatan fil Islam. Okay, فَأَكُونُ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. Amazing. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I didn't convert to Islam because of that. And by the way, Amr ibn al-As was like one of the later con- con- converts to Islam. Amr ibn al-As was one of the later converts to Islam. He was one that, be- why was the Prophet Sallallahu telling him this? Because he converted pretty much only towards the end of the time that Quraysh had any sort of standing. Okay. So he accepted Islam a little bit later. And so the Prophet ﷺ is trying to you know, tell him, don't worry, you accepting Islam is not going to make you somebody who's poor, right? It's not going to make you somebody who's impoverished. He goes, in fact, when you, I'm going to put you in charge of this army, but I'm going to make sure you're taken care of. We're going to take care of you, right? And Amr, he says to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, I never converted for this reason. He goes, I accepted Islam because I wanted to be with God and you, Ya Rasulullah, okay? Then the Prophet ﷺ, فَقَالَ يَا عمر. He says, "Ni'mal malu as-salihi lil mar'i as-salih." He says that he says basically that you know what a great he says it's the best case scenario when uh, good money goes to a good person. You know, you've basically proven in this moment that you're a great person because you've proven that you're you're not so obsessed with wealth that that's your only motivator for doing anything. That's your only motivation for doing something as well, right? He said, you're not that kind of person. Your motivation is so pure. And he goes, guess what? You're still going to get the money. You're still going to get it because it's your right. It belongs to you. It's one of the rules of fighting in a battle is that when you when you fight the battle and the spoils of war are there, it will be distributed. You'll get some. But the Prophet is saying, it's even more sweet now. It's even more beautiful now. Because you're a person who deserves this. Because you are not motivated by it, you deserve it even more, right? It's like when you meet somebody who is like wealthy, but they're also extremely generous. You know, you meet somebody who's very wealthy, Allah has given them very a lot of wealth, but they're so charitable. And you just say, oh Allah, you gave wealth to the right person, right? You say, oh Allah, you gave wealth to the right person, Okay. Uh, and it's amazing, subhanAllah, right? So this is one of the things that the commentator quotes. He says that, you know, there are those people. And, and he's basically telling us, be that person. Be the one that the Prophet ﷺ would have said about you. نِعْمُ malu as-salihi lil mar'i as-salihi. That the Prophet ﷺ would have said about you that the money is going to the right place. Right? It's, it's good money. It's a good person. It's a perfect match. It's a match made in heaven. Uh, so he says, and, and another example he says is that of Abu Bakr Siddiq where the Prophet Sallallahu said that, you know, uh, he said that the wealth of none of you, right, the wealth of none of you, ma nafa'ani malun qattun, 
ma nafa'ani malu Abi Bakrin. That he said that the wealth of none of you has benefited me like the wealth of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Like, like that's just, you know, it is what it is. And this is something that other companions would even testify to. They'd be like, we could never compete with that guy, man. He was amazing. The Prophet would ask for charity, he'd be the first one to give. He'd be he'd be running, right? People would think, oh, Omar, I have half of my wealth. Abu Bakr brings all of his wealth. Omar was like, what? How? How? How am I supposed to compete with this? I brought half of my wealth. Half. And this guy, on the day that I bring half, he brings all of it. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to compete with this, right? قَالَ فَبَكَى أَبُو بَكْرِ When Abu Bakr heard this, he started to cry. He started to weep. You know? Because the Prophet ﷺ, he's not, the Prophet ﷺ is not literally saying he's in debt to, to Abu Bakr. But you know the English term that we use, indebted to? So the Prophet ﷺ is not literally in debt to Abu Bakr. But you know how we say in English, someone can be indebted to somebody? So the Prophet is basically he's he's announcing his love for Abu Bakr. He's saying, like, I'm so indebted to this guy. You know, He said, O Messenger of Allah, how can I be indebted to you when me, my entire being and everything I own is for you? It's not even mine to give to you. It's yours to begin with, right? And this is why these people, man, subhanAllah, this is why they were successful. Abu Bakr didn't even see his wealth as his own. He saw it as belonging to Allah. Aslam, he's like, this belongs to Allah, right? And how can a person in that state ever confuse the goals of the akhirah with the goals of the dunya? They couldn't. They couldn't. Okay? So you have these situations where the Prophet Sallallahu you know, he teaches us through his hadith that people had money. Abu Bakr had some money. He says here, he says, uh, that they were people who used to do business. They were groups of companions who were businessmen and business women. That they used to do business, they used to trade. Okay? So he says, like, that's not, it's not a bad thing for somebody to do business and work. Of course not. And he says, وَمِنِ التَّابِعِينَ Sa'id bin Musayyib, a famous tabi'i, he says, Mata wa khalifa malan. Okay? That he left money behind when he died. He he had money, he had enough money to leave behind when he passed away. Right? Sa'id bin Musayyib. Amazing. So he's saying basically, it's not that a person needs to be concerned about the idea of money of itself, but it's what money does to a person, it's what wealth does to a person. Wealth can change a person's focus in life and make them forget the afterlife. As long as you're using money for you and it's not against you, as long as you're using money for you and it's not against you in the akhirah, then it is one of those things that will be a a a, a it will be a proof for you on the day of judgment and not a proof again. May Allah Taala grant us that. May Allah Taala give us that, inshallah, and more. Okay, um, we'll end here, inshallah. Um, but we still have a little bit left to cover, inshallah, next Sunday. But we'll end here. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people who are not uh, so in love with wealth that we lose, uh, you know, that we lose our um, our thoughts about Allah and the Akhirah, that we don't uh, completely find ourselves distracted. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people who love Allah more than we love the dunya. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people that always think of our financial responsibilities to, you know, Allah to the faith, to charity first, before we think of what things we can get for ourselves. Amin, ya Rabbil Alameen. Barakallahu feekum, everybody. Jazakumullah khairan. Take care, inshallah, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Stay safe. Uh, love you all for the sake of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.